Good morning, and welcome to our live stream this this morning. For the second week in a row, we're trying to see if we can uh, provide for you a time to worship together uh, here in your own homes as we uh, try to broadcast here from the church. The Bible says in that Messianic Psalm 22, Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered they trusted in thee and were not confounded. In verses 4 and 5, we hear that. A great reminder that we have a God that has always been active. We, he has always proven himself trustworthy. At the end, toward the end of that psalm, verses, uh, Psalm 22, verse 22, says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Well, we're going to be praising in the midst of the auditorium, but the congregation is scattered, and we trust that as we uh, get a chance to proclaim in all the, different, all the different homes that God is trustworthy, that we have trusted in him, we are not confounded, he will, we will never be ashamed. And we can praise him because he is at work, even when we can't see all that he's doing. I trust that you will uh, join me in lifting up our hearts, lifting up our, our minds this morning, in gathering together, trying to collect our thoughts to center around Christ's truth as preached from God's Word. Before we get started, I wanted to announce, first of all, I have my water here. And if you missed the live stream last week, you know why that's so important, just in case I, something weird happens and I start coughing all over the microphone right before Pastor comes in. Um, but I did want to remind you a couple things that we, um, I, we want to keep putting out there for you. As we have mentioned in the bulletins, we've mentioned it from the pulpit a number of times. I'm still finding that some of you have not yet taken that step to get the notifications, the reminded texts, or the emails from our church, um, and you're still wondering what's going on. So please take that step tomorrow if you want to call the church office and get signed up for the Remind text, then all the church announcements that we want to give to you, reminders about the live stream services, reminders of any schedule changing, um, that will be available to you just by via text message. And so you can call the uh, church office to get signed up for that. Charmaine or Linda would be able to help you with that, uh, more so than past. Pastor Berlin or myself, but they can help you with that, and uh, and then getting as well signed up for the emails. A lot of prayer requests come by um, as we find that some of our membership might go into the hospital, and we want to um, ask for emergency prayer for them. We and uh, various announcements along those lines. So just a way for us to, as the congregation, to re keep tabs on one another, uh, keep up to date with what's going on here. Uh, please do sign up for that. Uh, regarding the live stream, you've seen perhaps uh, on Facebook some announcements and. Uh, uh, there that we have not only streaming from our church website, streaming on Facebook Live, um, but also we have added a new function. It's a it's uh, online dot church, uh, FBC Warren dot online dot church. That is a new interface that. Um, we believe that as we get that up and running, it seems like some people are having some trouble with that this morning, and others were successful, so it's, uh, we have some kinks yet to get out of that, but we're really excited about the opportunity to do that, uh, to use that as it has an opportunity for you to write comments, have the links that are available to you regarding the YouTube and Facebook and the church website, uh, the giving uh, link there if you would like to um, be reminded about how to do that. Uh, there's also a tab that has uh, access to the Bible, and you can just access the Bible right underneath the feed of the video there, uh, ways for you to respond as well and even to chat um, about some of the points in there. And so we look forward to uh, hopefully getting that up and running full power here. And so you can give that a try. And, uh, and you make use of that. Um, all uh, extracurricular activities, as a reminder, are on hold at this point, and we will communicate with you if more things be are, as we're able to start doing some things, Lord willing, here in a week or so, um, depending on how, um, how everything spreads or calms down and all of that. Uh, please be prayerful about that. Uh, don't just sit and wonder, don't just sit and follow the news, but be in prayer that the Lord would orchestrate things so that we as a church and we as in our normal daily function, so many, so many people in our congregation are affected by their jobs and their places of work, um, just uh, being limited that way, and uh, just be in prayer for one another. There's some certain needs that are going to be coming up, and uh, we want to make sure not only for our health and safety, but also with financial safety for our membership, and um, that we can see God at work in that. And that Let's just ask God to decrease the length of this time and to be used that way. 
Some of you, as Pastor mentioned, had been asking about what to do with offerings, and uh, we're not necessarily needing you to quick run and bring money here. But if you would like to send it in, drop it off at the office, you can use the, uh, the website for the online giving opportunity there, or you can hang on to it and bring it when you come. Uh, any of those things, uh, we understand a couple more people as of last week signed up for online giving, and that is really the easiest way to do that. So if you have a question about any of those things, again, you can contact us and we can uh, get you in contact with people who can help you if you need on that. With that being said, let's go ahead and turn to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll turn things over to Pastor and begin the preaching. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you are a God who is in absolute control, that you have, over all of history, shown yourself to be not only the one that is aware of things that are going on, but you're the one who is orchestrating it all. And you orchestrate things in a way that we cannot understand. We're limited to just seeing the impact to our own lives and those who are surrounding us. But Lord, we know that you are at work and that you are doing things that uh, are for our good and that are for the good of all of us around. And sometimes for our good, we have to go through some struggles, some troubles. Uh, This is the, uh, the, the training ground for wisdom and growth and maturity. So we ask that you would provide that in your people. I pray that today, as we uh, look in your word, that you would make it come alive. Thank you for the Sunday school teachers that, uh, in classes that we're able to get together and, and, um, and see one another through online uh, media as well, and for the teachers who are experimenting with a new way to uh, contact with their, with their students. We pray that you would bless our congregation in all the different places that they are. Bless our friends that are watching here online as well. We pray for health, we pray for safety, we pray as well that you would limit the spread of the coronavirus. We pray that you would um, allow us to see your hand at work in this. Thank you for um, how you have orchestrated things even in our state and that you've kept us safe so far. We thank you for uh, those who perhaps were struggling with some sicknesses and and, uh, that the test for the coronavirus came back negative. Thank you for these things. Thank you for your work. Uh, We pray that you would help us to walk in wisdom, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, and that we would also redeem this time. Some of us are finding that we have extra time, and as uh, Pastor Brandenburg in Sunday School reminded us, that we ought to strategically use that time to draw close to you, studying your word, uh, hearing it, uh, reading it, memorizing it, meditating upon it, and um, and consuming it uh, as our own necessary food for our spiritual lives. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good morning. I hope that you are all uh, ready to worship the Lord together. Uh, I was reminded that it's important for all of us to, in a time like this, to be an example of worship in the midst of our people's worry, to be an example of faith in the midst of people's fear to help people understand peace in the midst of panic. And so as we look at these uh, opportunities, really privileges in the midst of a difficult and somewhat confusing time, uh, certainly a time of of, um, disruption, certainly a a time where we are uh, managing life much different than what we were before the coronavirus, I do believe that these are very important times that uh, we take advantage of. I view them as an opportunity. I view them as a privilege uh, to participate in God's purposes according to his program. And so let me encourage you uh, to keep your eyes focused where it needs to. Last week we looked at keeping our eyes focused firmly upon God and uh, living out our faith and um, doing it with a proper respect and humility before God. Let me, uh, let me encourage you, as you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, let me encourage you to join us again tonight. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be preaching a message that I'd, I have entitled, Vices versus the Virus. And, um, and it's not uh, a message that I want you to take away as a message where I'm minimizing the impact or urgency or danger of the coronavirus. Uh, It's not a message where I'm necessarily 
uh, just browbeating people who struggle with addictions or vices. But I want us to evaluate tonight, honestly, how did we get here? We've never in my lifetime experienced a shutdown of our society both here and around the world like what we're experiencing right now. And the question is, is it because of our fear of getting sick? Is it our fear for our health? Is it the fear of people dying? What is it that is driving the societal shutdown? Because I think that facts help us to understand that if that were the case, then we have a lot of other much more dangerous concerns that are hurting our society and causing way more deaths than what the coronavirus does. And yet it doesn't seem to shut down our society. It really, to some extent, is what drives our society. And so uh, I just want to take an honest view from God's word as to how do we uh, comprehend, what do we do with the data, and how do we then address our own heart and then minister to a society uh, who really is, is trying to cope with a whole lot of data, a whole lot of news media, uh, a whole lot of rhetoric uh, that is being Uh, bombarding us from all different angles. How do we take the word of God, take those truths, calm our own heart that we may give direction and help to the community that we're trying to serve? And so I hope that you'll join me again tonight uh, for that message at six o'clock. This morning, I want to uh, keep my promise and preach the message to you uh, entitled The Importance of the Local Church in Gathering. Uh, It is certainly a time where uh, there is adjustments, and we are, as many have said this morning, thankful for the avenue of technology. We are thankful that we have a way to stay connected. We have a way to worship together corporately. We have a way to expound and to teach the Word of God and to allow it to manifest itself in our lives, in the transforming of our lives, in conforming us to the person of Jesus Christ. I hope all of that takes place this morning. There are some warnings, and there are some dangers that we all have to be honest about as it relates to having church in our homes. Can I remind us, this is not the way God designed it. This is not the avenue for which we are to habitually have church. The word of God is clear that it was important that the church gather. And we want to look at that from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Can I just give you four dangers uh, that you and I are going to have to guard against more you than me because I'm still going through the same motions uh, pretty much that I would all of the time. Uh, I'm still preparing messages and I'm still preaching them and I'm still coming to church and all of those things. But you and your family all of a sudden are able to sleep in a little later because you don't have to get ready. You can dress in your pajamas and and have church. You can really even be doing multiple things at the same time because it's just you and your family. And can I tell you, there are some real dangers that we must be honest about as it relates to this um, this format that we're using right now. The four dangers are, number one, the danger of convenience. In other words, uh, it would be very easy for people to conclude that, wow, this is a lot more convenient way to have church. Well, can I tell you that God is more interested in us conforming to his design to, than to that which is convenient for us. The second one is comfort. 
It's more comfortable to be in your lazy boy. It's more comfortable to be lounged out on a couch. It's more comfortable uh, to be sitting in your own home. And it certainly is a danger to the necessary change in order to get ready and get out and get on time uh, to actually be in church. And so one danger that we're going to have to address is this danger of being comfortable. And thirdly, carelessness. Uh, There is something about uh, our conduct as it relates to uh, consistency and what is expected, what is going to be accountable. And part of the reason why God wants us to assemble is there's an accountability that helps us to be motivated. It helps us to motivate each other, but it also helps us to uh, motivate each other to be what Christ wants us to be. A, there, there is an, a necessity to be consistent, but it's really easy to be careless when we don't have that accountability. And then the fourth danger is that of casualness. Let me encourage you, families, and I'm not, uh, obviously I I can't see into uh, each of your homes, and you're thankful for that, I'm sure, as so am I. But what we do know is that sometimes it's easy to not get ready for worship. Uh, I had Pastor Brandenburg send me uh, some things on the internet from a preacher friend, which I thought were very, very good, Uh, actually a missionary from Papua New Guinea. And and he he mentioned in this time, uh, get up and get ready and get dressed and prepare your heart and your mind like you always would. And then go and, and prepare your heart through silent prayer to receive the word of God Allow yourself to participate, even uh, saying amen or making sure that you stay engaged and not easily distracted. Make sure that you're not allowing yourself to to do something else that you would not do during church uh, just because you can in your home, but, but to take it serious and to make sure that your heart and your mind are concentrating and that you're not falling into this idea of just taking worship casually because that can be addictive. It can be contagious. And we want to make sure that in the midst of the privilege of using live stream, the, the benefit that we have as a church to be able to stay connected and to be able to uh, declare uh, the word of God in a, in a powerful way, we're thankful for that. But we need to remember that God's design for the local church is way different. It includes the priority of gathering. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, you follow along as I read. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. In other words, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. He's already been at the church of Galatia. He has already been uh, going to different churches and explaining the need for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Uh, Many of them had gone through incredible uh, times of trial and tribulation. Uh, The church in Jerusalem, these individuals, oftentimes as they would get saved, Uh, would be disowned by their family, oftentimes disowned by the society, many times fired from their job, many times if they owned a job, nobody would come in and buy from them. And, And there was an incredible poverty that was coming as a result of these new Christians in the church of Jerusalem. Paul, being very sympathetic and concerned about the greater church family, other brothers and sisters in Christ all around the region, uh, getting a collection together in order to meet the needs of these struggling saints in Jerusalem, uh, has come to Corinth. And he's writing ahead of his visit, as we know, and and he is simply saying to them that uh, concerning this offering, uh, here's what I, I want you to do. Verse number two, upon the first day of the week, 
Let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. The idea of gatherings is not uh, contradictory to my message title. The idea is, as Paul is simply saying, when I, when I come, I don't want you all uh, saving your money and, and, and keeping it so that we all have to come to one place and you bring and, and we get it all at one time. He goes, I just would like for you to do all of that ahead of time. I would like for you to ask God what he would have you to contribute, that you would go ahead and contribute it, that you would gather it as a church uh, so that when I get there or the person that I send there uh, will be able to just get it and be able to get it back to the saints in Jerusalem. And that's the picture. But I think the important thing in verse number two is that first phrase He says, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. In other words, Paul makes a very high priority under inspiration that for the church, there was an importance that you meet every week, the first day of the week, Sunday, and that you come together and you bring that which God would have you to give and that you would come together and worship and part of that would include the stewardship of the various responsibilities for us individually and for us as a church. Verse three, and when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. That liberality is simply your generous giving. In other words, that which you choose to give to meet the needs of these dear saints, um, when we agree on who it is that I'm going to send and that you trust and I trust, I'm going to send them uh, in order to take that generous giving and uh, take it to meet the need. Can I just pause uh, as your pastor and say, as it relates to your giving to Faith Baptist Church, even in the midst of these different times in different ways, I am humbled. I am thrilled at the maturity of Faith Baptist Church. The the discipline to give, the discipline uh, to make uh, the priority of uh, providing uh, money that God has entrusted you to, to further eternal work, either here or abroad, has been really, really encouraging to me. And it is a testimony of each of your maturity and the importance that you find in obedience to God. We say it all the time and we absolutely mean it. You and I own nothing, but we are mere managers, stewards of that which is God's. And you have shown incredible maturity as it relates to that truth. And I want to commend you and thank you for that. Well, Paul is saying here, uh, I want you to know we'll be responsible with your stewardship. Verse number four, and if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. In other words, I may be the one uh, who is accompanying them to Jerusalem. I just don't know my schedule yet. Then he goes on to talk about a few things. But um, he says in verse number eight, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. And then he says in verse number nine, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me and there are many adversaries. Can I tell you what Paul was going through and the opportunity he saw was of God in the midst of adversaries, in the midst of obstacles. He saw tremendous opportunity and that's exactly what I think you and I are facing in a time like this. Yes, there's obstacles to our worship. Yes, there are obstacles uh, to our everyday life. Yes, there are obstacles even to being able to go to work and to and, and to function the way that you've always functioned. And, and yet, I think it's easy for us to get pessimistic, to get problematic, rather than being optimistic and seeing them as opportunities. God has not lost control. God is not uh, up in heaven wringing his hands, looking at Gabriel going, what is going on in the world? That's not the case. God is in heaven making everything happen according to the counsels of his own will. He has allowed everything to happen for a purpose. He is allowing it to happen right on time. He is allowing it to happen in the very fullness of time, which is the exact purpose 
uh, time that he wanted it to happen for the exact purpose for which he desired to accomplish. And so this is an opportunity. We can get very pessimistic and we can get very selfish and say, but my life is disrupted. My life isn't the same. I'm going without. I don't get. And you can become a little spoiled brat if you're not careful in the midst of all of these changes. Or you can step back and say, God, this is an opportunity for which I want to be a good steward. Would you please help me to manage this situation and this opportunity to the praise of your glory, to be able to exalt your person and your program in the midst of this time? That's really what Paul says in verse number nine. Then he goes on to talk about Timotheus. He talks about Apollos. He talks about these men of God and uh, the important part that they may play even in the Corinthians and specifically in the meeting of the needs of those in Jerusalem. But then he says in verse number 13, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, means act like a man, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. Verse number 17, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus and uh, Achaicus for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. God gives then a conclusion under the pen of Paul who demonstrates his love and affection for this dear church and for the people of God. I have entitled this message, the importance of the local church to gather. And in the midst of adversity, in the midst of of trial, God has given to us an opportunity. But I think sometimes that little phrase, absence makes the heart grow fonder or absence will make the heart wander. In other words, one of two things are going to happen you're going to see the importance of the local church. And your heart is going to tell you whether you miss your brothers and sisters in Christ and long for the opportunity to get back together, are begging God and asking God to make that uh, request to be able to do it in his time, in his way, Uh, Much like uh, two people who are in love, people who are are looking uh, maybe for a future together, but uh, distance has taken them apart and they're they're longing for the chance to to be able to see each other. Yes, it's wonderful to be able to FaceTime. Yes, it's wonderful to be able to Skype. Yes, it is wonderful to be able uh, to talk on the phone. It is wonderful in our day and age where everyone walks around connected to each other through a cell phone. But I'm going to tell you, whenever I've been separated from my wife and my children, any time that I've been away from my church, as much as I enjoy being able to stay connected, there is nothing like being able to be with them personally. Let me ask you this question. How is your heart regarding getting together with your brothers and sisters in a corporate setting for worship at Faith Baptist Church? Are you longing for that? Are you asking God for that? Or do you find your heart beginning to wander? Do you find that your heart is getting off track? And so as we look at the text, I want us to be reminded of a few things that will help us to just keep this truth before us. Why is it that we assemble? Let me just give you uh, three important things. They're really not my message, but I think it's important for us uh, to remember is that we gather together to encourage faithfulness. In other words, we want to encourage faithfulness to God's word. We want to encourage faithfulness to godly worship, making God the focus of everything that we do. But we want to gather together uh, to, to motivate and to help each other be faithful in God's work. God's program for this dispensation is the local church. And we exercise our gifting, we use our talents, and we participate together as one unit, as one body for the glory of God in the reaching of our community, even of souls all around the world. And we do that 
together and we motivate faithfulness with each other. And then second of all, we engage in fruitfulness. In other words, it is our desire as a local church to bear fruit in souls. Can I ask you? Who have you witnessed to in this time to help them have peace in the midst of panic, to take their attention to faith in God rather than the fear of the coronavirus? Have you helped them to truly worship, letting God have his rightful place, understanding my place in the midst of worry? You see, we live in a day where people are looking for answers. I think it is incredible, I'll mention it tonight, but when you stop and think about how easily the world can be deceived, how easily the world can be manipulated, how easily panic can be given and decisions can be made worldwide in just a couple of weeks. And then we step back and look at what does the end times look like? I think these are very good times to ask the question, are these birth pains? Are these the beginning to the end? Is this something that God is setting the table? I don't know. I'm not not able to tell you the time nor the day, but I do know the seasons. And I'm going to tell you, the more I see, the more rapture practice that I do. And, um, And I think it is very important for us to keep our eyes on what it is that God is doing. But are we being fruitful for souls or are we just biding our time? Are we getting distracted with things that are not the priority, even in the midst of this time? And then we want to be fruitful in our sanctification, and that is that people are growing and being distinctly different from the world. And then uh, to in, in trust, uh, to embrace fellowship. In other words, God wants us as a unit Uh, to fellowship. You know, one of the things that blesses my heart, many times after a service, even if I've preached late, many times in that service, I like to just look around in the foyer, down the hallway, in all different parts of the auditorium, watching our people fellowship. They love each other. They're interested in each other. Uh, they, they laugh together. They pray together. They, they, they enjoy each other. What an incredibly uh, good testimony of a strong church, a, a church that has strong ties that is driven by a genuine love for God that's manifested in a genuine love for each other. And that's important. And in order to really use that as an edification and and encouragement to those around, to be an exhortation to everyone in our church, you have to gather to be able to see that. You have to gather to be able to experience that. And these are some of the importance. We, We gather to encourage faithfulness, to engage in fruitfulness, and to embrace fellowship. But what does the text also remind us? And so, number one, I want you to remember that we gather because we're stewards of specific principles. Right off the bat in verses one through four, we realize that we're stewards of the money that God has entrusted to us or the treasure that God has given to us. We have a responsibility to God to take that which he's entrusted to us and use it exactly the way he wants us to. I understand that God provides so that you and I can provide for our family, so that we can experience life, that we can enjoy that which God has given to us. And we serve a good and gracious God who gives us great liberty uh, to be able to take his money and to do some things uh, that we enjoy and that uh, bring us great happiness and to allow us to be able to be fulfilled in so many different avenues. And we thank God for that. But can I also remind you that there are responsibilities outside of our world that God has given us money to do. He reminds us through this text that there are brothers and sisters in need. 
And sometimes uh, those brothers and sisters in need are our missionaries who are across the lands and, and sharing the gospel and, and uh, separated from their family and, and going through uh, various different hardships. And we, we partner with them, we participate with them uh, as we uh, send funds and, and support what God is doing through their ministries and we partner with them. But also what God is doing in our local church and what he's trying to do in Warren and Michigan and America and, and the, the, the amazing dynamic of our church. And so I'm thankful that God has allowed us to participate with our treasure. But also it's important as, to, as it relates to our stewardship of time. Did you know that it's really easy for us to be selfish with time? One of the things that has come to light, and I mentioned it on Thursday with my uh, fireside devotions in the morning. By the way, can I just tell you that this week we're going to look at the topic that God is sufficient. Uh, you know, I was challenged by Pastor Brandenburg's Sunday school lesson as to the place of the word of God, which is God revealed to us his truth imparted to us. And it's more important than food. It's more important than sleep. It's more important than anything else in the world. But let me ask you, is God more important to you than your health? Is God even more important to you than life? If he would so choose to take you to heaven, is God more important to you than your stock market and the money that you may have lost or whatever the case. Let me ask you, is your sufficiency, your fulfillment in Christ, or have you found that you're looking to other things for sufficiency or fulfillment? We want to take our 9 o'clock in the morning, 10-minute uh, to, to 15-minute chats and just look at, God is God sufficient? He is. The question is, are you allowing him to be your sufficiency? And so I want to encourage you to, to uh, join me for those. But really, when we stop and we look at our time, do we convey to a world that God is enough, that God is all that I need, that I am complete in him and I need nothing else? Or do I say those things, but then if people watch my life, I need this and I need that and I want to spend more time here and I... God is teaching us we're a steward of our time. Do you know that even making church a priority, even by way of live stream as a family, bringing them together uh, so that we can uh, grow in grace together during this time is important. And so we are a steward of principles of treasure and time and talents and so on and so forth. But God is teaching us in these first four verses that we gather together as an opportunity to manifest our stewardship for these specific principles. So when we come together on a given uh, scheduled service, we are coming together for the sake of exercising those stewardships, being able to make uh, time for that which God says is important first day of the week making sure that we're, we're spending our money the way that God wants us to so that he is glorified, using our talents in a way where God is on display and that we make much of God. But the second thing that, that we need to remember is that we're stewards of possibilities. Verses 5 to 9, Paul is going to talk about uh, some possibilities that God has uh, given to him and some things that, that um, he doesn't know exactly how it's all going to work out, but he sees them as possibilities. He really sees them as opportunities. And can I remind you that that's exactly what this time is. Uh, this is not a trial that God is interested in wasting. This is a, is a trial in which God wants us to triumph, that we, we handle the trial in such a way where the, the community around us, as they view our life, come to a right conclusion about who God is and what God is like. And so Paul says, you know, I want you to know that, that part of, of what we do as a church is taking full advantage of possibilities, opportunities. God has a great um, plan for Faith Baptist Church. 
And when we come together and we gather together uh, as a unit, uh, oftentimes in Scripture, when the church makes a decision, the, the Greek word gives the idea of the extending of the elbow or the support in favor of. And, and uh, that's such a critical part of the way the church is to function. And we come together with a stewardship of possibilities. Does God want us to do that? Does God want us to start that ministry? Does God want us uh, to... Uh, embrace that uh, privilege or opportunity? Does God want us to support that missionary? Does God want us to bring that person into membership? These are things that as we gather together, we say, yes, I believe God is in that. That's what the church does. And if we don't get together, we never get to experience what God has brought us together to do. And, and Paul is simply telling this church, listen, there is a great door of opportunity. It is an effectual and it is open to me. Oh, there are obstacles, but I don't see them as problems. I see them as possibilities. And let me ask you, are you taking this opportunity to realize that we as a church are given possibilities that we would not be given if we were not going through this trial. We as a church need to stay connected. I appreciate the hard work of our teachers and, and all that's being asked of them in our Christian school and, and being able to stay connected with their students and to continue to educate their students and to be able to uh, work with parents. And, and they've, they've gone over and above and they have done an amazing job of, of doing that. I'm, I'm watching our Sunday school teachers work to stay connected and to, to make uh, those connection points and to make sure that they, they let their students know that they love them and that they're praying for them and that it matters uh, what they're going through and that we're in this together. And though we may be separated by distance for a time, that we long to get back together because that's how we link arms in our service for, uh, for the Lord together. And so we're stewards of possibilities. And then he closes by reminding us that we are stewards of people. Verses 10 through 24, verse number 13 and 14 are the key. And he says, here's what you do. Here's what, when you gather together and as you disperse after those meetings and you come back together and you disperse after those meetings and you come back together, what is it that you're evaluating? What is it that you want to build each other up to do? What is it that you want to keep each other accountable in what they're doing? What is it that you're monitoring how you can serve together and how you can serve each other? Because the ministry is about people. The ministry is really about reaching people with the gospel, watching their lives transformed from darkness to light, allowing saints of God to be conformed to the very person of Jesus Christ so that their life becomes less consumed with self and a lot more about their Savior, and that as the church goes forward, we together are a group of called out people reaching more people for the time that we have because the day will come where there's going to be no more chance to reach people. There's going to be no more chance to uh, grow in our sanctification process for when he comes, all of us who are saved will be glorified and all those who are lost uh, will, will be lost and those that go to hell will never get out of hell I'm always reminded and my heart grieves that for those who are in hell, there's never any more grace. There's never any peace. There's never any joy. There's never any long suffering. There's no more mercy. You see, all of those things are things for which we minister to people today. And so we are to be people who are helping each other to watch. What are we watching for? We're watching for the return of Christ. We're watching uh, for the devil who is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We're, we're watching uh, out for each other. 
We're watching for those opportunities to share the gospel and encouraging one another to take full of advantage of those opportunities. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. What is it that the word of God says? Who is it that the word of God declares God to be? Stand there. Did you know that nothing about God has changed in the light of the coronavirus? Nothing. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he wants every one of us to stand together in those truths, encouraging one another, helping people to stand in the faith, and then act like a man. What is it that, that, that it's talking about? Men are to be courageous. They're, they're to be men of character, principle, integrity. These are the, the, the picture, and, and, and Paul is saying, listen, uh, I don't want somebody who, who runs from the battle. I don't want somebody uh, who goes AWOL in the midst of fighting. I don't want somebody who, who cowards uh, in the midst of a fight. I don't want that. I want you to act like a man. I want you to have and show some courage in the midst of the trial. I want you to, to demonstrate some character and some backbone some integrity in the midst of what you're going through. And then he says, and be strong. I'm reminded that God says, be strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus. In other words, our strength comes from humility. God wants us to take the trial, the intrusion into our schedules and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? What is it that I can do in the midst of your program? How is it that I can magnify you in the midst of these times? You see, we gather together as a church to help one another in these simple commands. And he says here in, in, verse, in chapter 16, upon the first day of the week, there are some things that you come together to do. Yes, it's prudent. I realize that the, the penalty for meeting has been lifted by our governor, and I'm thankful for that. I think that gives great, uh, gives great accolades to the fact of our freedom, our religious freedom, and, and the attention that it draws and the importance that our country sees on it. But we still have to be wise. We still have to be prudent. And, um, and so we want to do that. I appreciate your prayers for me as I make those decisions. But as we go through this trial, and you, some have said, Pastor, are we going to have to go without church all the way to April 5th? I don't know. I don't know that any of us know. I know that as of right now, the directive's been put in place to try to curb uh, the impact of the coronavirus. We want to be a team player. We want to support in that process. And I don't know. I don't know uh, how society is going to respond. I don't even know how, how the virus is going to respond. I, I don't know any of that, neither do you. But I do know this. I'm thankful for every opportunity that we can connect in technology. But can I also remind you that God's design for us is to not stay connected technologically. It is that God would bring us together and gather as a body function as a body, glorify God as a body, to edify and exhort and encourage one another in the things of God. And I look forward to getting my whole church family back right here where we can worship together corporately just as soon as God allows. May God bless you. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, I do thank you for your design of the local church. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I do miss them. I'm thankful that we can connect in this avenue. But Lord, it's just not the same. I look forward to being able to shake their hands and hug their neck. I look forward to being able to uh, do the work that you have called us to do together, to be able to see fruit born to be able to see lives changed, families encouraged and edified. I thank you for souls that have been saved and 
souls that will yet be saved as we begin to minister again together. But Lord, I do pray that you'd help us to be faithful with our stewardship. Help us to realize that trials and tribulations are part of your program and they have a divine purpose. Help us to be responsible with it. And I pray that as a church, you'd help us to grow even in the midst of this time. Increase our faith in the midst of a world of fear. Help us to worship you while the world worries and help us to be a testimony of peace in the midst of panic. And we'll thank you for it. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Love you dearly. Lord bless you.